Hi, everyone. I'm Jim Falk, president of the World Affairs Council of Dallas-Fort Worth. Thanks so much for being here with us and joining us with this webinar with Robbie Grammer. Uh, he is the diplomacy and national security reporter at Foreign Policy. And if you're not yet following his Twitter feed, you really should, because he's getting scoops out of the Department of State that you're not going to see anywhere else. Joining us today for this conversation is my good friend, Amanda Schnitzer. So let me tell you a little bit about Robbie Grammer. As I mentioned, he does cover diplomacy and national security at foreign policy. He spends most of his time at the Department of State. Before coming to foreign policy in 2016, he managed the NATO portfolio for the Atlantic Council. Uh, he's also a graduate of American University where he studied international relations and European affairs. Amanda Schnitzer, she's a neighbor. She just lives down the street from me. Uh, and prior to joining Puente Bello, where she's now the chief operating officer, Amanda was director of global initiatives at the George W. Bush Institute. And I have to say, as an outside observer, I could see that her work supporting President and Mrs. Bush had such impact, especially on issues such as gender equality and democracy. Uh, she really helped steer forward many important steps in countries such as Tunisia and Afghanistan. So Amanda, thanks for being here. Uh, Robbie, looking forward to this conversation. It's all yours. Well, thank you, Jim, and thank you, Robbie, for being a part of the program today. Good afternoon, everyone. It's really a pleasure to be in this forum with you during unusual times. Um, I really want to commend the World Affairs Council and the team there for what I've called rapid response and relevant programming during this unusual time. I think the um, invitation to Robbie to be a part of uh, the programming is a great case in point. So thank you all and thank you to the team at the World Affairs Council. So Robbie, should we begin? Let's do it. Thanks okay. for having me. Yeah, well, there's no shortage of things to talk about today in our world. And Robbie and I are gonna do our best to take a bit of a tour of the, the hot spots in the horizon in the next few minutes and then get to our audience questions. Uh, before we dive into the issues though, I wanted to help us all get to know Robbie a little bit more and what it's like to be doing his job in Washington during a time like this. So maybe Robbie, could you tell us a little bit about how you got into international affairs reporting in the first place and what does your day look like now in terms of deciding what to cover, how you have actually had to change your style or tactics to cover the issues and um, what it's like to be a reporter in this time? Yeah, yeah, thank, uh, thanks. And thanks again for, for having me. This is, um, I'm really excited to be here. Um, so before um, I uh, jumped into journalism, I, I worked at a think tank, which is, um, uh, really a feeder in, into government work. And there I got a, a pretty good glimpse into uh, the, the inner workings of the US foreign policy system as complicated and convoluted as it is. Um, and uh, I just sort of on a whim uh, applied for a, a job at, at foreign policy and, and got it and found out that I, I love journalism. So I've been covering the uh, the Trump administration's foreign policy um, in, in its entirety, um, a little bit at the end of the Obama administration. Um, and it is uh, fast paced and wild. And of course now, as I'm sure everyone who's attending can attest, it's just weird times. Um, Washington DC is on lockdown. So whereas my, my day back in pre-pandemic would be rushing between meetings on Capitol Hill or or at the State Department or other federal agencies. Now I'm sort of cooped up in my in my apartment trying to do the same work uh, via 10 million Zoom calls and and Skypes and uh, and phone calls and everything like that. But I'm uh, I'm happy to be here and and share some of what I've what I've been covering since the pandemic hit. Well, thank you. Well, there's a lot to talk about today, and I thought we might start sort of big picture and then work our way down into some of the, the nitty gritty issues. Um, there's a popular line in Washington that many of you have probably heard. It's usually, and I think actually mistakenly attributed to Winston Churchill that goes something like this. Americans will always do the right thing only after they've tried everything else. And it's possible in this one that we're in a similar kind of moment in history. So I thought we might break 
this down into a kind of a two-parter, Robbie. So first question to you is, what's going well with US diplomacy in the midst of this unprecedented global pandemic and economic shutdown? What's going well? Let's start there on a positive. Yeah, yeah, I think, um, uh, well, to start off big picture, um, at this point, knock on wood, there aren't any other major international crises we have to deal with. There is not Russia invading another neighbor. Um, there is not North Korea launching significant uh, weapons tests in its nuclear program. So, so if the administration needs to focus only on one thing, this is the only thing that seems to be rearing its ugly head. Um, within Washington, I think I think there's a there's a there's a few good news things that are sort of flying below the radar. Um, one, the the United States is is marshaling a lot of resources, a lot of funding um, to send to other countries to help them, even as we're scrambling with our own response. Um, and those are some of the less developed countries in Africa, um, in Southeast Asia, that that really need help. Um, and the virus could get much worse there without U.S. assistance, which of course might come back to the United States. So it's sort of um, um, helping spread the, the response around the world. Another thing I've noticed is that um, particularly in, in the months before and after impeachment, there's just been this new level of hyper-partisan anger and, and vitriol we've seen on Capitol Hill and elsewhere. And some of that has dissipated. Um, it, it seems, you know, with some of the members of Congress that I've interviewed and spoken to in recent weeks, it seems like on both sides, they're acknowledging that, um, you know, it's it's time to to sort of tone down the, the hyper-partisan rhetoric and, and work together and, and pass bills. Um, of course, that doesn't magically mean that uh, that everyone's friends again, but but it is it is a bit of a, a difference that we've seen in recent months than from the uh, impeachment era that gripped Washington for the beginning of the year. That's really interesting. It's good to hear that some things some things are changing even for the for the good. Well, let's always a few silver linings. <laughs> yes, there are some strange blessings in all of this, but um, we'll have to analyze those another day, maybe. Well, let's look at the, the other side of this and talk a little bit about what's been more challenging from the perspective of US leadership in the world, building strong partnerships and coalitions to get things done in the midst of a crisis. Where, where if anywhere, are we coming up short or need to think about um, our responses today? Yeah, well, um, you know, as the, as the cliche goes, where, where you stand depends on where you sit. Um, I think for a lot on the on the Republican side, they would uh, they would dismiss those criticisms that there were, that were lacking leadership and strong partnerships. Um, you know what what GOP leaders, what some of the administration tell me is that you know the United States is still the number one um, country out there, the number one superpower. Um, it's it's still the number one donor of aid and global health, and that's not going anywhere. Um, they're saying the United States is doing a good job of countering China and trying to hold China to account for um, mishandling the initial spread of the uh, of the virus. Um, uh, and I think in in their mind, a lot of a lot of what you're hearing, a lot of the criticism that that might be coming out of Washington is uh, is focused solely on the president and not at the facts and the, at facts at hand. Um, of course, that's not everyone shares that view. Um, you know, I've spoken to a lot of foreign diplomats, democratic lawmakers, um, and and a lot of them feel frustrated that there's just this intangible absence of U.S. leadership in international forums like in NATO, like in the United Nations, like in the G20 or G7, where in the past you would see the United States not just attend these meetings, but play a leadership role and sort of knock heads together and corral and uh, and coordinate a global response. And they're saying that that we're not seeing this right now. Hmm. Hmm. You know, it's interesting that you mentioned in the silver lining part of this, um, the good news part of this, that the United States is, it's a good thing that there's not another major sort of catastrophe or war or, or other world event happening of similar magnitude. Um, you know, military strategists think about how would the United States be able to engage in, in battle and in warfare on more than one front at a time. Um, it it kind of leads me to the next question, and that is that, you know, President Trump has described himself as a wartime 
president in relation to the pandemic. And certainly even in, in our country right now, we see US Naval hospital ships that have been deployed in New York and in Los Angeles. In some communities, the National Guard has been called up to help with kind of soft power things like helping with the distribution of food at food banks and setting up field hospitals and even helping with testing at nursing homes. Um, what works and maybe what doesn't work about this sense of war in a time like this, especially thinking about what you said about, you know, the projection of US leadership, both at home and abroad? Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's definitely true that the United States is relying on the military here to bolster uh, its first responders. Um, I mean, in that sense, it is an unprecedented crisis, a whole of country effort. Um, and it's hard to think of anything really since World War II where every American has been so directly impacted on a personal, tangible level as as with this pandemic. Um, but but the wartime analogy is, I think, a little bit imperfect um, for a number of reasons. Um, first, uh, of course, it's it's not a war, and it's not something that can be easily fixed with with military might, um, um, as we're learning the hard way. Um, and second, the the military isn't entirely set up to directly confront the pandemic. Um, there was a lot of news recently that um, these U.S. Navy hospital ships that were deployed both to the West Coast and East Coast. Um, were sent to help uh, the you know the government respond to the the surge in cases, but these ships, along with the rest of the military, aren't exactly equipped to deal with a pandemic. These ships uh, were originally set up to uh, ease hospitals with the non-pandemic related cases they have, the regular, you know, car accidents or uh, or other health concerns they have before the pandemic. Um, and so they don't have the, the exact type of equipment, the exact type of gear, the exact type of know-how to really directly respond in, in the way that our overburdened hospitals do. We've, I'm going to take a question from, the, from our audience that is relevant to this discussion, and that is sort of a sense of, you know, how much is the United States looking inward at this time um, versus looking outward and, and sort of and the effects that that's having on our foreign policy going forward. Yeah, I mean, I think I think that's a really good point. I think the United States, like every country, is is looking inward, trying to you know protect the home front first. Um, one of the stories I reported on a couple of weeks ago is there was a um, the State Department, um, an office that deals with U.S. foreign aid sent to countries in Eastern Europe and Central Asia. Uh, sent out a memo to all of uh, the embassies abroad asking them to see if those foreign countries could deliver medical supplies and medical aid to the United States. So here for decades, for, for a generation, we've been the one delivering aid. And now these, these offices within our, our foreign policy establishment that dole out U.S. foreign aid are asking these other countries that we gave foreign aid to for help. So it, it's, it really underscores how how unprecedented this is. And I think that that points to some of the criticisms that I've heard um, from those on the Democratic side, as well as foreign foreign diplomats and, and foreign envoys, that um, the United States doesn't seem to be playing that, that traditional role of global first responder, of global leader, as it has been in, in the past. Yeah. We were, we're going to come back to some of that aid coming into the United States from from, from other countries. We'll come back to that. Um, let's turn though for a few minutes to the State Department. Um, we're talking about pandemic diplomacy today and um, in one of your recent pieces, I'm gonna quote from it, you write that amid his normal duties, Pompeo, Secretary Pompeo is busy overseeing one of the most unprecedented and complex crises in the State Department's history. We know the Secretary has doubled down on pre pandemic issues like Iran and Venezuela at the same time that he's dealing with the crises that you have written about. We know that the world continues to turn on its non-COVID access and issues like the United States in the midst of this handed over a strategic base to Iraqi forces. Um, a new country was admitted into NATO recently. How can the United States, Robbie, balance all of these priorities? And what's your sense of kind of where the focus needs to be right now? 
Well, I mean, in uh, a lot of the experts and diplomats I talk to, point uh, the first thing they point out when I ask this question is, uh, we can't afford not to balance all these priorities. Um, these these big existential issues uh, that the administration sees um, from Iran, from North Korea, from China, from Russia, they aren't going to go away overnight. Um, and so far, like I said at the beginning, we've been lucky. None of these crises have have cropped up again, but but they could. And so it's sort of that you need to keep your eye on the ball on, on everything. You need to walk and chew gum at the same time on dozens of different levels. Um, at the State Department itself, Pompeo caught a lot of criticism actually in the early months of the of the pandemic for not really playing a leading role. Um, he wasn't seen, you know, on in these sort of infamous daily White House press briefings alongside a uh, a president or vice president Pence or other health aides or or the defense secretary, um, but but that's starting to change after a slow start. The State Department has really leapt into crisis mode, and one of the I think one of the biggest uh, and perhaps most underappreciated uh, stories here is how many the sheer volume of Americans stranded abroad that the State Department has had to bring home, um, and there's so many diplomatic logistical feats to get these Americans who've been stranded abroad at home. Um, everything from, you know, U.S. Embassy personnel having to negotiate when and where flights could come in to negotiating with commercial airlines, how many crews do you need on the plane, um, you know, how long do they have to be landed and, and rest up according to, you know, federal aviation guidelines. Um, to how do we get Americans who might be in rural areas in places like Ecuador, or Morocco, back to a city where they can actually find a flight. And so far, um, there, you know, there was a really rocky start. Um, the State Department caught a lot of criticism for leaving Americans sort of stranded in ways that, that other allied uh, governments like France or Germany or the United Kingdom didn't with their citizens abroad. But since then, they brought home almost 60,000 US citizens all the while, while these embassies abroad have to try to protect themselves and their own embassy personnel in the middle of this pandemic. And so far there's been, um, there's been a handful of deaths of State Department personnel, um, one American and several locally hired foreign nationals at embassies abroad. But there, there are more cases cropping up within the diplomatic corps as there is in the US military. Mm. You know, we're so grateful in this country and around the world right now for those workers on the front line of this crisis, from our healthcare workers to the men and women working in the grocery store. And sometimes it's, it's easy to forget that part of that front line are the men and women serving in the U.S. State Department and serving our country and serving others around the world. So a moment to remember all of them today, today too. Um, part of and part of being able to respond to a crisis like this is actually having your your leaders in place. And Robbie's got a very interesting piece out today um, on, at foreign policy about the logjam in getting kind of key foreign policy posts filled. The the Senate is actually having difficulty. Well, I'll let you talk about it, Robbie. You can describe it better. You did the reporting, but what's happening to create this log jam of kind of, of frontline foreign policy leaders, including in some very critical roles relevant to the current crisis? Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, yeah. Um, so, so I, th so basically, there's um, there's over a dozen nominations for uh, really key administration posts. Um, that are stuck in the Senate now. Senior uh, senior positions in any administration require presidential nomination, but then Senate confirmation. Um, but no one before this ever thought, well, what if the Senate ever has to face a pandemic and can't actually show up for work? Um, so there's a lot of lawmakers and staffers on Capitol Hill scrambling to navigate these weird arcane uh, rules in Congress right now to figure out how to hold hearings and how to carry out their legislative branch duty. Um, of oversight of, of the executive branch. Um, and so as part of that, the committee that oversees, um, you know, appoint or confirming ambassadors, um, senior posts at State Department, US Agency for International Development, um, international development banks, et cetera, um, don't really have a right answer yet on how to do that. Um, and Democrats are saying that the, um, some of these nominees can't, can't be uh, 
uh, confirmed without without in-person hearings while Republicans are trying to push them forward. Um, and I think, as you know, and as everyone knows, you know, a, a meeting on Zoom can be really interesting and engaging, but it's not quite the same as, as meeting and talking in person. Well, that's the same for, for these confirmation hearings, for what the Senate and, and House does in its regular oversight duty, where they haul up administration officials for questioning or grill nominees um, who are in the hot seat at the moment to figure out if they're really up for the job. Um, so some of the ambassador posts that are caught in limbo right now, um, there's one post for the U.S. Uh, representative on the board overseeing the World Health Organization, um, which we can talk about if you want, since that's a whole interesting other can of worms. Um, the U.S. ambassador to Canada, our northern neighbor, um, one of our largest trade partners, the U.S. ambassador to Jordan, um, a key uh, partner in the Middle East, and a bunch of other posts. So I think this just goes to show that um, we're in totally uncharted territories here, and at every level of the government, people are sort of building the plane as they fly it, trying to figure out how to carry out their normal duties from, uh, from afar and on Zoom. Yeah, I took a look this afternoon at the rules of both the Senate and the House, and there are no apparent provisions that I could find in a quick search about how to address such an extraordinary kind of 21st century um, crisis situation. So probably look forward to some thinking, hard thinking about that in the future. Yeah. Um, well, you, you mentioned the World Health Organization. Let's turn for a few minutes um, while we have them to talk about some of our, the international organizations um, that are playing a big role in, in the current crisis. One, certainly the, the World Health Organization has been in the headlines for, for many days now. Um, and our, sort of in the course of just a few weeks, kind of our position as a, from the administration has, has changed pretty dramatically. Um, just a few weeks ago, President Trump was talking about the importance of the U.S. investment in the World Health Organization um, and touting that as something that we should be proud of. This week, he has made the decision or the announcement of withdrawing U.S. funding. What's, what's going on between the United States and the World Health Organization? Well, all of this centers around China. Um, and the, the Trump administration has been pretty vocal in blaming the Chinese government for um, mishandling the initial outbreak of the, of the virus that originated in the Wuhan province of China, trying to cover it up, trying to silence people, sounding the alarm bells about it. And uh, in their mind, and I think a lot of scientists and virologists would agree, if, if China hadn't mishandled that, rejected international aid, pretended the problem wasn't there at the beginning, we might not have the pandemic we have today. Um, now, the World Health Organization, um, China is a member and a donating country, and so uh, w top WHO officials have been working hand in hand with China um, throughout this throughout this crisis. Um, and the the Trump administration is is really angry at the World Health Organization for, in their mind, sort of carrying China's water on this, um, um, repeating Chinese government. Uh, uh, facts and figures at the beginning of the of the outbreak that now seem to be uh, misleading or wrong, um, being careful not to criticize China when the United States think they should have, um, and all this sort of came to a head in in recent weeks. Um, and now you've got a pretty regular drumbeat um, from some lawmakers calling for the resignation of the WHO director. Um, uh, Director Tedros um, and saying that the United States shouldn't fund the WHO until he's sacked. Um, the the matter of funding itself is a little bit more complicated than the headlines that you might have read about this um, for a couple of reasons. First, the um, a lot of the funding that the United States sent the WHO um, has already been allocated. Um, it's already been sent over. So there, there's only a small fraction left that that the United States can cut off. Um, and from my understanding from talks with UN and, and US officials, um, there's going to be a lag time before the WHO starts feeling the pinch from this, uh, from this cutoff of funding for, for at least several months. The second is the WHO does not just respond to the coronavirus pandemic. A lot of the money that the United States sends the WHO goes to polio eradication, um, goes to fighting the outbreak of Ebola, um, a, a, 
a, a disease that's that's way more deadly than the coronavirus. Um, then there was a big outbreak in uh, Central Africa last year and this year. And so not all of that money is going to go toward the coronavirus. Um, this is uh, um, my my suspicion, though I can't confirm it, is that the administration is is trying to use this as as a bit of a negotiating tactic um, to get the WHO to more publicly acknowledge some of China's missteps um, and also um, bring back Taiwan as an observing member of the WHO, which is of course a very sensitive issue for China because China does not recognize Taiwan's sovereignty and in its mind that Taiwan is, is a piece of, of China. I've got a question from the audience that's relevant to this part of our conversation. It comes from Amanda Long, another Amanda. Um, what are the long-term consequences of the weaponization of foreign aid during, during the crisis? That's a, that's a really good question. Um, and just to back up for a second, um, there's been a lot of discussions in Washington and other capitals about foreign aid during the crisis. And the reason is that um, a lot of countries that used to rely on foreign aid suddenly saw China coming in and delivering masks, medical supplies, doctors to help them out, countries like even Italy. Um, whereas in the past, the United States would be the country doing that. Um, and some people saw that as a real sea change, as, as China, even if they were responsible for the initial outbreak of the pandemic, sort of trying to come into this role as, as a global leader and challenger to the United States. Um, and so on, on the flip side, um, there has been criticisms uh, of this administration for politicizing foreign aid, for only sending foreign aid to countries that vote its way in the United Nations or, or countries that don't seem to have the same level of tensions with the president directly as others. So in terms of the long-term consequences, I mean, it's uh, this is sort of a cop-out, but it, it remains to be seen. But I think it's definitely an issue that is keeping a lot of uh, U.S. and other Western officials up at night now with, with China coming out as a, as a big international aid donor. Yes, we're going to get to China in just a minute. Um, a couple more questions around the topic of international institutions. Um, let's talk for a minute about the G7 and the, the G20. Um, this week, a group of G7 officials issued a statement that went like this. The scale of this health crisis is generating unprecedented challenges for the global economy. Ministers and governors recognize that an extraordinary and well-coordinated international response is critical to reducing the depth of the crisis. Um, how would you assess the response of the G7 and the G20, both to the kind of the urgent needs of both established and emerging economies? Well, at this point, um, I'm not seeing much tangible from the G7 or, or G20 um, other than these, uh, uh, these big sweeping directives saying we acknowledge this is a problem and we need to fix it. Um, of course, the, the G7 and G20, um, their, their main purpose is uh, or their real importance is not in these these statements that are issued, but in the behind the scenes meetings that uh, that the public doesn't get as much access to. Um, I mean, I think that in a way, the G7 and G20 are a bellwether for how the international community can cooperate on this. Um, if they can get along, if they can issue a, a nicely worded summit at the end, that's a good indication that behind the scenes, the leaders were cordial. They were talking about you know, the nitty gritty of how to coordinate. Um, and if they can't do that, then that's another sign that they can't. Um, the reason I bring that up is that um, a few weeks ago in the last G7 meeting, um, uh, there was a joint summit that was ultimately derailed by the Trump administration because Pompeo, the Secretary of State, insisted that the G7 statement um, take a harsher line on China um, and call call the virus the Wuhan virus um, or, or the um, Trump himself has even proposed calling it the Chinese virus. Um, and WHO officials, other countries thought that was needlessly provocative and might have even fueled a bit of xenophobia um, toward the Chinese people. Um, so it turned into a bit of a diplomatic fight where some thought there didn't need to be. Um, so the fact that these, summit, that these summit statements are now coming out is a good indication that behind the scenes they're working together. Um, but I don't think you'll see the G7 or G20 play an active, tangible role 
in you know activating funds, delivering aid in the way other international institutions has, or in the way the G20 played a big role in um, in uh, fundraising a lot of money to tackle the big Ebola outbreak in 2014 that happened in West Africa. You know, I know that at least since the collapse of communism in Central and Eastern Europe, there have been lots of discussions about sort of the, the relevancy of post-World War II institutions to the problems and challenges of today. Do you think that this current crisis might bring that conversation back around to say either what reforms do these global institutions need or what new ones might be required to address the kind of 21st century challenges that we've never seen before? That is a million dollar question. Mm -hmm. um, and if I had the answer to that, I suppose I could make a lot more money and be a lot more famous. But <laughs> um, I do think that there is a lot of serious discussions right now about the UN and particularly the UN Security Council, the main decision making body, because um, in the past, well, in the past several years, the UNSC has just not been as productive as it has in the past because of gridlock and deadlock. Um, fights behind the scenes between the United States and Russia and China, um, and just not a lot of diplomatic uh, uh, capital expended to try to fix those. Um, with the coronavirus itself, that's really laid bare how, uh, how deadlocked um, and ineffective the UNSC has become. They haven't even been able to issue a, um, uh, a joint resolution on the coronavirus um, in, in recent weeks. Um, and there's, there's debates, there's a bunch of wonky internal debates so I, I don't want to bore your audience with about how the UN should meet over Zoom and if, and if it can vote over Zoom, if those are legally binding. Um, but it, it is definitely true that all of those questions um, are, are leading into this big picture question that you're asking of, are these institutions set up for 21st century challenges? Uh, if the pandemic can sort of almost overnight bring a, the global, the international community, the global economy to its knees, what are the point of these, of these international institutions? Um, and uh, I think that's one of those questions where we're going to have to, we're only going to find out sort of in hindsight, looking back. Mm. I've got a question that's related from Donald Llewellyn that says, you know, how does the U.S. response to COVID-19 compare to its response to SARS, H1N1, Ebola, and other epidemics? And maybe in this context, talk about the U.S. response and more of the, the global institution response to previous pandemics and health crises. Well, in, when there have been outbreaks of, of some of those, uh, of those diseases in the United States, uh, the United States immediately informed um, international partners, foreign governments about the outbreak. Um, they were transparent in communicating where it was. Um, in the critical early days, and that helped prevent, um, you know, an H1N1 or SARS-like outbreak in the way that we're seeing uh, now. Obviously, the Chinese government took a different tack of, of covering up, even uh, threatening to jail uh, doctors that were raising the alarm bells at the beginning um, before suddenly coming out and saying they were an international leader in this and sort of trying to rewrite their own history on it. Um, one example that that I have looked into that um, a lot of global health experts I've talked to brought up is the 2014 Ebola crisis in West Africa. Um, and what happened there was at the time the, the United States convened a G20 meeting um, with uh, the Secretary of State John Kerry um, really behind the scenes cajoling and and uh, and convincing all of these all of these countries to throw money in the pot and try to tackle this. Um, it spread, it was, it was bad, it was deadly, it was devastating for the economies in, in West Africa, but on a whole, compared to what we're seeing today, it was, it was localized and in some ways a, a much more successful international response than what we're seeing today. Interesting. Well, you mentioned Russia and China and looking at the question lineup in the, in the Q&A, there are a lot of questions about China. So let's, let's go to Russia and China. Um, Russia first. So Russia, using President Trump's words, sent us a very, very large plane load of things, which was very nice. Um, by that, we'll get back to the, the, the topic of foreign aid coming in from, from other countries. In this case, we've received it both from Russia and from, from China. Uh, what and whose purpose do you think that that aid 
serves? Well, this, um, the aid came as everyone in the administration was saying, look, we need to get as, mon as many medical supplies as soon as possible to the states, to the cities in our country that need it. Um, and that was their reasoning. Um, now, at the time when diplomats, other U.S. officials were reaching out to foreign governments to see what aid uh, or medical supplies we could buy off them or, or redirect to the United States, um, a lot of them were actively avoiding trying to ask Russia and China. Um, this came up because of a direct uh, phone call uh, between President Trump and uh, Russian President Vladimir Putin. And so Russia sent this, uh, this military plane um, to land in New York um, to deliver aid. And you know, it was a small amount of aid. It sounded like a nice gesture. Obviously, the, the president has been trying to uh, revive relations with Russia for, uh, for, I guess, his entire administration. And that's a whole other issue. Um, but the bottom line is this was a major propaganda coup for the Russian government. Um, the, the Russian state media, which is ground zero for a lot of disinformation aimed at undercutting the West, was having a field day on the day that this plane landed. Um, and the optics of a Russian uh, military jet delivering aid to the United States um, um, turned into a big win at home for Vladimir Putin. Um, now, whether the aid was worth it, um, in the end, if it was worth it to take the optics hit, um, you know, people are torn on that. But, um, but it, it, it doesn't change the fact that, um, that uh, it, was, it was a big PR victory for, for Moscow there. You know, China has taken some tools from the Russian toolkit recently. Um, by that, I mean a couple of examples. In mid-March, the PRC's foreign ministry spokesperson tweeted that the United States military is to blame for COVID-19. I know we've got questions about that from the audience. Less than a month later, there was the scene uh, in Boston of a New England Patriots jet arriving with a million N95 masks. So is there confusion in the Communist Party about its great power competition with the United States, or is, is all of this strategic on Xi Jinping's part? The, I, that's a good question, um, and people devote their whole lives to trying <laughs> to sort through the, the palace intrigue of, of of the corridors of power in Beijing. I can't pretend to be an expert on that. Um, what I can say on the, on the disinformation front is it's, it's interesting because Chinese and Russian disinformation has always sort of been apples and oranges. Um, the Chinese government has always tried to stifle, censor, um, uh, and dominate the narrative with one singular narrative. Whereas Russian disinformation has been all about flooding the field with you know, 10,000 conspiracy theories and hoping a few of them stick and just, you know, inundating everyone with so many different alternate narratives that, that the truth uh, uh, sort of gets lost in the, in the snowstorm there. Um, and what we're seeing now is that the, the Chinese government and, and proxies of the Chinese government that are spinning out disinformation are sort of adopting the Russian stance. Um, they're, they're flooding a bunch of alternate conspiracy theories out there, like you've seen with with some of these Chinese diplomats on Twitter. Um, I'll, I'll emphasize the irony in, in Chinese foreign diplomats um, saying these things on Twitter when Twitter and other social media sites are banned and censored in their own country for their own citizens, as an aside. But um, I think you're starting to see sort of a transformation and uh, weird uh, help uh, echo chamber of Chinese and Russian disinformation here that we haven't seen ever before. Um, where you know Chinese state media outlets or or Twitter bots, et cetera, uh, will amplify Russian uh, disinformation and vice versa. Um, and so there's a whole new, uh, I guess, domain of this disinformation battlefield that that we've been tracking uh, for a few years now with with the pandemic. Mm. So the the cover of the Economist this week asks, is China winning? So let's take a couple of questions from the audience that, that follow this thread. So I've got one question here from Amit Chabra. In the face of the pandemic, is the US poised to give up on meeting the challenges faced by China's rise in Asia? Or is this alternatively a good time to reprioritize um, via defense, commercial sales to Vietnam and India, 
Um, that is, uh, that's a great question. Um, I think that the, the pandemic shows that, that China is sort of uh, slowly trying to slide into a global superpower status, um, but it also shows it's not there yet. Um, so it has, you know, sent a lot of medical equipment abroad. Um, it's definitely increased its clout in the UN, in the WHO, in other international institutions, as the United States role has sort of been diminished or pared back for a variety of reasons. Um, China is very good on the PR front. When they send a shipment of medical supplies to uh, countries like Italy or Iran or other countries that are facing the worst of the pandemic, you can, you can bet that it's going to be on the front page of their state-run newspapers, um, that they're going to, they, they actually press these foreign countries to, uh, to publicize themselves that they're getting this aid in exchange for getting the aid. And the United States has always, uh, at least on the government side, been kind of bad at, at marketing itself. Um, it quietly delivers, you know, tens of billions of dollars of, of global health aid year over year. Um, and just because China is the new kid on the block, it's getting a lot more media attention. That doesn't mean that all, you know, the United States has magically stopped investing in global health. Um, and so the, the Chinese are, are definitely exercising a lot more global influence. I think the pandemic has laid bare what's, what's been sort of going on behind the scenes for a long time now. Uh, but it's also true that, that China isn't, just isn't looked on the same way as the United States and U.S. diplomats in, in forums like the G20 or the United Nations yet. And it doesn't have quite the soft power clout that the United States has. Also, as a, you know, there, there's a significant part of this angle that uh, the United States is a democracy and, and China is a dictatorship. And so um, I think you're going to see China slowly emerging on, on, the, on the global stage to try to uh, compete with the United States for that global superpower status. But it's the, the game is not over by any means. That's really interesting. I know with some of the China hands that I spend a lot of time with, I mean, one of the things they're keenly watching is what about China's response, particularly in the early days of the um, outbreak in China, what weaknesses did that sort of bring to the, bring to the surface, both within China and in its ability to, to project power globally? Is that something that you're watching at all? Yeah, and you know, a lot of people, a lot of China watchers, um, some some government experts have actually compared it to Chernobyl, the the nuclear disaster in in the Soviet Union and what's now Ukraine in the in the eighties, where the disaster was horrific in and of itself, but it was also this perfect uh, microcosm of all the failings of the Soviet system. Um, and I think a lot of people are pointing to this pandemic as the the perfect emblem of the failure of the Chinese system of um, of you know stifling freedom of information of um, threatening to imprison people who were who were talking about it over over heavily surveilled uh, social media apps that are available in China um, and uh, so I think that there's there is definitely something to be said about that. And also, you know, every administration official, uh, Republican lawmakers, Democratic lawmakers, uh, foreign officials, they all say uh, there will be a time where we're going to do an autopsy on what happened here, piece together exactly what happened. Some say the time's not now, let's set aside our differences with China and sort this out and, and fight that fight later. Some say, no, we need to fight that fight now to get the record on at the beginning. Um, but either way, um, I think there's going to be a real in-depth, piece by piece, blow by blow, look at exactly what happened here with the limited inf information we can get from, a, from an authoritarian state like China. And out of that, I think you're going to see a lot of failings and missteps from the Chinese government side. Yeah, it's interesting. I know just even in the last few days, I've been reading about um, Chinese citizens who are very carefully monitoring the arrival of family members to pick up the cremated remains of their families and that the numbers of people arriving at um, arriving just don't correlate to the official reported numbers of deaths meaning it, indicating much much higher so I think you're right, right. there's a lot more 
there's a lot more to information to, to come out of this. Um, I've got a question from Michael Watson that may be relevant to this, and that is, here's his question. One of the newest topics regarding COVID-19 is that it's an international creation in a laboratory in China, probably located in Wuhan. Um, can you speak to this? Yeah, so there's been increased reporting on this. Um, and I've, uh, my, uh, my colleagues and I have been digging into this for about a week. Um, I'll caveat that I am by no means a medical expert or a virologist or, or someone who can, uh, who can really fully understand this, but I've talked to a lot of them and it, and it boils down to this. Um, there are two theories out there that uh, this virus originated in a, in a lab. One of them is that it was a bioweapon that was mishandled, uh, something created in a, you know, in a lab, a, a militarized uh, human created type of virus that got out. Um, and another is that there's, uh, this virus was, you know, collected and being monitored. It might've occurred naturally in a bat or another animal and was being monitored in a China lab and just got out because of a lab safety accident. The consensus from all the, from all the medical and health experts I've talked to is that the bioweapon is almost impossible um, for a number of complicated science reasons. I admit, I don't really understand but it's basically very hard, thank goodness, to manufacture a virus of this type um, on your own. Um, but the other, the other theory that this could have been, you know, a naturally occurring virus um, that got out because of, you know, very bad lab safety or people who didn't know what they were doing in the labs, that one's taking root. Um, and I think a lot of a lot of medical experts I talked to really cautioned. Uh, me and other reporters in, in reporting this out to stress that they don't want to fuel any conspiracy theories here. There's still a lot we don't know. Um, but what I can say is that U.S. officials, both in the U.S. intelligence community um, and in the State Department um, and members of Congress on these relevant committees are seriously investigating whether this could have been a lab accident. Mm -hmm. um, I, there's just not enough information out there now to, uh, to say whether that's, that's accurate or not. And, and there are just as many theories that might've been likely or more likely that this had nothing to do with the lab. Mm -hmm. Got a question from Tatiana Sisk that says, do you see changes with manufacturing plants moving back to the US after COVID-19 crisis? Um, and I especially maybe put that in the context of some of the headlines today about medical supplies and equipment that are held up and being shipped to the United States um, from China, um, apparently over issues of ensuring quality and ensuring they don't um, violate export controls. Can you can you speak to Tatiana's question? Yeah, um, I think uh, we always learn from a crisis too late and hindsight is 2020. Um, but afterwards, in the aftermath, I do think there will be a lot of serious conversations about um, national stockpiling of medical equipment to make sure nothing like this happens again, making sure that the military has enough supplies for its personnel um, should the need arise where there is, you know, some sort of health crisis. And they also need to respond to any, you know, military contingency out there in the world. Um, I can't speak to whether how that will play out, um, whether it involves legislation with private businesses or whether it just involves the government buying up more of a stockpile and sitting on a, a bigger reservoir of medical equipment afterwards. But there are a lot of conversations right now about, um, about legislation that might be passed to prevent this type of thing in the future. Mm. Um, I know we're, we're rapidly running out of time. I'm going to try to give you sort of a round robin of some questions from the, from the audience. Really great questions here. My apologies to those if we don't get to your question today. Um, I've got a question from Ray Termini about the U.S. election and um, how Joe Biden, if he's elected president, sort of blend foreign policy ideas from Obama, from Sanders, from others, and maybe put that in the context of where we are today in the United States. Yeah, um, I will. Uh, luckily, I, you know, a week ago, I wouldn't have known anything about this. Uh, but luckily, I was assigned a, a story to report out on this. Um, after, uh, after Bernie Sanders um, announced he was suspending his campaign, I know that um, the Biden team 
has been in contact with the Sanders foreign policy team, um, and they're actually setting up joint working groups to, to sort out exactly these questions. So um, it seems like the Biden team is, is taking a much more open tent approach um, and bringing in, you know, the progressives, um, you know, the, those from the those from the the Bernie side of, of the party as well as those centrists. Um, and so uh, they're, they're still working through it. Um, I think you'll see uh, Biden adopt uh, some more of those of those further left policies and and tones in, in his in his campaign as the general election kicks off, assuming that we can have a normal election this year, hopefully after, after all of this uh, winds down. Um, some of the Sanders foreign policy people I talked to said that this pandemic um, really underscores how uh, the issues he's been harping on, such as health care, um, you know, wealth inequality, everything like that ties into national security. Because, of course, uh, if your health care system and infrastructure is, is struggling, then that means uh, that there's a whole bunch of knock on effects that could impact national security, um, as we're seeing in the middle of a pandemic right now. Mm. And I attempt unless Jim cuts me off to get to maybe two more questions. Um, here's a related one from Ryan Dukeman. You previously covered Rex Tillerson's redesign of the State Department. What will the next administration need to do to rebuild the State Department um, so that it can respond to the pandemic and, and long-term consequences? Um, there's a few things. Um, one, right now for I think the first time in modern history, there's no career diplomat um, who has a senior position in the State Department with one exception, the Under Secretary of State, the State Department's number three. Um, and so empowering uh, career foreign service officers, career diplomats, I think would be a priority for future administrations. Um, I think, too, there's just this rhetoric of um, the deep state um, that's really caustic and has really damaged morale at the State Department. Um, whether you buy into that or not, um, whether you do believe that there is a deep state uh, working against the president or you don't, um, I personally do not, knowing all of, uh, speaking to State Department people all the time every day, but there are, um, uh, that type of rhetoric does really hamper morale. Um, and the last thing to, to keep in mind is that uh, the State Department has faced budget, repeated budget cuts year over year. Um, the, they've been fended off by a bipartisan group in, in Congress, but um, uh, if, if the State Department is the equivalent of, you know, uh, 15 aircraft carriers, then, then maybe that, that requires a, a rejiggering of priorities here. Um, and I think also, you know, going back to what we were talking about with China, um, for the first time we're seeing Chinese diplomats start to overtake U.S. embassies abroad in terms of the number of their personnel, in terms of their, you know, how they're posturing publicly. So so if we want to, to get into this era of great power competition that the administration um, likes to prioritize, uh, you can't do it without a strengthened State Department. And particularly after the impeachment scandal, which the State Department was dragged into, um, that's, uh, uh, they, they've been battered and bruised for a few years. So if maybe final question, the very first person to get a question into the Q&A box today wanted to know what you like best about your job. And so maybe we end with that question and, and one just of what, what gives you hope in the midst of all of this? The, the issues that you're covering are really difficult for our country, for the world. Um, what do you like about what you're doing right now and the role that you play as a member of the media and the press? And, and what gives you some optimism? And then I'll hand it over to, to Jim. Well, that's it. Thanks. Thanks for that question. Um, the, the great thing about being a journalist is you can sort of, your job is to be an expert for a day. Um, so I love taking a deep dive into a different issue depending on what flares up in the news or what my assignment is or different tips I get from sources um, on everything from, you know, a pandemic to uh, a crisis in Eastern Africa to, uh, you know, negotiations on Israel-Palestine. Um, and then I get to call the real experts and talk to them and learn a bunch. So I, I basically get paid to learn and on the side I have to write, um, which is really great. Um, what gives me hope is that um, I, I will admit I'm a little bit cynical after a few years of covering things in Washington, but despite that, I think the pandemic has really uh, uh, given everyone, policymakers, lawmakers, and uh, a, a gut check on how 
uh, caustic hyperpartisan rhetoric can might be damaging and how maybe we need to bury the hatchet and, and work together and and get things done and and I am seeing more of a tone of that more of that atmosphere um, uh, here in Washington today at least from my apartment where I'm currently stuck on day 40. <laughs> I always like to end programs on an optimistic note and I think that is one. Uh, Amanda, as always, great to see you. Hope to see you in person soon. Robbie, thanks so much for being with us. Hope everyone is doing well. Thanks again for being with us. We'll see you next time.